Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual home of Princeton Public Library here on Zoom. My name is Janie Herman, and I am the Adult Programming Manager at the Princeton Public Library. It's my pleasure to host this evening's program featuring Lee McIntyre to discuss his book on disinformation. It's a powerful pocket-sized citizen's guide on how to fight back against the disinformation campaigns that are imperiling American democracy. And this book was just released yesterday and what a timely release it is in so many ways. Before we begin, I'd like to extend special thanks to MIT Press for their assistance in arranging this event. If you'd like to purchase a copy of today's book, I will be putting a link in the chat to help you do so. The library also has uh, a copy of the book on order. Uh, since it came out yesterday, it's not quite cataloged, but you can join the wait list for it. So I'll put that link in the chat as well. Please note that this event is being recorded and our events typically go up on the library's YouTube channel within a few days. If you have friends or colleagues who could not make it today, let them know that it has been recorded and to check out for our YouTube. I will now introduce our guest and ask them to turn on their camera so they can join us on the screen. During this conversation, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function or in the chat uh, for our speaker to answer um, after they do their reading and talk. So Lee McIntyre is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University and a recent lecturer in ethics at Harvard Extension School. He holds a BA from Wesleyan University and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Michigan. He has taught philosophy at many places, including Colgate University, Boston University, Tufts Experimental College, Simmons, and the Harvard Extension School. Uh, he is uh, associate editor in the research department, oh, formerly the research editor in the, in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, as well as a policy advisor to the executive dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. Uh, in addition to the recently released uh, on disinformation, he is the author of many, many other books, including Dark Ages, The Case for a Science of Human Behavior, Post-Truth, and The Scientific Attitude, Defending Science from Denial, Fraud, and Pseudoscience, all of which were published by MIT Press. We are so thrilled to have Lee McIntyre joining us on Zoom tonight. Welcome, Lee. Thank you very much. I, I'm so glad to, uh, uh, to be here. Um, so as you said, the book just launched yesterday, and um, I'm uh, sorry that I I can't <laughs> that I can't be there in person, but this is the uh, the next best thing. Um, the title of my book is "On Disinformation: How to Fight for Truth and Protect Democracy," and it's a very small book. It's it's tiny. It's just a little manifesto. Is uh, what it is. You can read the whole thing in about an hour and a half. And you can carry it around in your back pocket. But in some ways, I feel like it's the most important work that I've ever done, even though it's the shortest. Vladimir Lenin, the father of modern disinformation, said this at the dawn of the Russian Revolution. There are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. And I believe that we're now living in such an era. In 2018, I published a book called Post-Truth, this was the dawn of the Trump presidency, and I wanted to write something to help us understand what was going on. I was inspired by another very short book uh, by Tim Snyder called On Tyranny. I wonder if you know that book. And that book really inspired me because it set up a strategy for trying to understand what we were facing at the time. With On Disinformation, I wanted to write something before the next election. I wanted to uh, write something while there was still time. Because I think that in some ways, the threat that we now face is even greater than what we faced in 2016. In his book, Snyder said, this is one of my favorite quotations ever, post-truth is pre-fascism. And that's really the, the summary uh, of, of the work and inspired my work, because he's right. I mean, here we are. We're not living in an autocracy. We're not living in a Author under authoritarian rule, but we are pre those things. Uh, other countries like Hungary have gone through what we've just gone through and ended up losing their democracy as a result of it. And so I think that if we don't stop this, uh, we could face the same fate. But the first step in stopping it is to understand the threat. 
The assault on truth that we faced over the last eight years is not an accident. It was an intentional strategic plan by those who had something to gain by it. You'll often hear newscasters and others speak of today's problem as one of misinformation. But be careful. Misinformation is a mistake. It's an accident. It's when you believe something false, but there was no intention behind it. It just happened to be false. And maybe even you'll hear facts and change your mind and you'll understand that you were wrong. Disinformation is not like that. Disinformation is a lie. Uh, disinformation is an intentional falsehood that is shared by someone who has an interest at stake in getting a group of people to believe that falsehood. Uh, that is, they want something. So the lie uh, fulfills a strategic purpose. And this is why it's so dangerous, I think, for newscasters to confuse mis- and disinformation. Because if you report on a problem as misinformation, then it's like it's a natural disaster. It's like a hurricane. What can you do about it? Nothing. Just put your head down and be scared. But if it's disinformation, then it's a lie. And if it's a lie, there's a liar, which means that there's something that you can do to fight back. Right now, I believe that we're in an information war. One of the scariest books I have read recently is called The Handbook of Russian Information Warfare. It's a, also a slim volume. It's free. You can get it online uh, as a PDF, or you can write to NATO like I did and get, a, get your own copy. Um, this is a book prepared by NATO, uh, given the title, a Handbook of Russian Information Warfare. You might think it's a, a Russian training manual. It's not. It's a NATO training manual for their soldiers and commanders to wake up to the fact that we're already in an information war with Russia. The book includes little gems like this. Quote, in the Russian construct, information warfare is not an activity limited to wartime. End quote. That's a chilling little sentence. The book goes on to say that for Ru the Russians, information warfare is a constant activity pursued sometimes in concert with kinetic war, but often in hopes of achieving the same strategic goal without entering into armed conflict. And then I quote again, quote, if measured by these criteria, recent Russian activities in the information domain would indicate that Russia already considers itself to be in a state of war, end quote. That sentence was written in 2016. And what's the goal of that war? Again, I quote, the ultimate aim of this highly ambitious imp uh, implementation of information warfare is in effect regime change, end quote. They're talking about us. The goal was regime change in the United States. And that sentence was written in 2016. Donald Trump became president in 2016 after a full-scale disinformation campaign by Russian operatives that resulted in 126 million voters seeing their propaganda posts on Facebook. Without access to the full unredacted Mueller report, we may never know whether those posts were definitive, whether they swung the election. But we do know that they tried. And we also know <clears throat> that Donald Trump is himself a master class disinformer who learned from Putin's playbook and employs many of the same disinformation tactics that the Russians do. The fire hose of falsehood, whataboutism, the repetition effect, those are all um, part of the arsenal of Russian information warfare, and I discuss them all in my book. So disinformation can come from both foreign and domestic sources. And this is the war that we're fighting right now. And we're not exactly winning this war. Joan Donovan, one of the world's great experts on disinformation and who recently became a colleague of mine, I'm proud to say at Boston University, said this at a congressional hearing a few years back, quote, the biggest problem facing our nation is misinformation at scale. The cost of doing nothing is democracy's end, end quote. Now, I didn't want to have to write on disinformation. Um, Biden was president, and I just finished writing my earlier book called How to Talk to a Science Denier, and I thought I had it all figured out. Uh, you solve an infodemic um, by talking to people who are misinformed. You show them calm and patience and respect, and you try to build trust to get them to listen to your facts. And I tried this by going out on the road and talking to science deniers. And I still think that what I wrote in that book 
is true. But then I realized something. That solution cannot be done at scale. And we could never do it in time to solve the problem. That is, the, dis the disinformers are pumping out disinformation faster than we can debunk it by talking to the people who believe it. This problem wasn't getting any better. And in fact, it was getting worse. During the pandemic, we all saw this. All of a sudden, anti-vax became a thing. I mean, we were, for, we were faced not just with people who were misinformed and afraid, but people who had been politicized around a factual issue and were full of distrust and even hate. Now, why? And why had this mindset now metastasized into reality denial? Because that's the next thing that happened around the 2020 election and what happened on January 6th. Had science denial paved the way for reality denial? That's what I wanted to think more about. A few years back, some cognitive scientists found that all science deniers follow the same flawed pattern of reasoning. They cherry pick evidence. They believe in conspiracy theories. They engage in illogical reasoning. And they believe in fake experts. And they also believe that the other side, say science, has to be perfect in order to be credible. So, and I now saw Trump and his followers using this same blueprint for the big lie about the 2020 election, the same identical one that the climate deniers and the others were using about science, he was now using about reality. So should we just talk to them calmly, patiently, with respect? I mean, yes and no. I mean, yes, we should do this, but it's only part of the solution. It's very hard to do to convince someone if you've ever tried uh, that. I have. But there is more to do. And this is when I really had the epiphany that led me to write on disinformation. The science deniers that I was out there talking to weren't just misinformed believers. They were victims. They were people who had been radicalized by someone else's strategic campaign of disinformation. This happened with tobacco in the 1950s. It happened with fossil fuels in the 70s and 80s and up till today. It then happened with vaccines, as we saw right up through the pandemic. And these people, these believers, these victims were suffering for it. I mean, how many thousands of people died during the pandemic because they believed misinformation and disinformation, because they believed that there were microchips in their vaccines. But how many of you knew that that falsehood, that rumor, that lie, that there were microchips in the vaccines was from the Russians? That was a disinformation plot from the SVR, which is one of the branches of the, the offshoot of the what the KGB. They did that on purpose because they had a competing vaccine. And it was wildly successful and thousands of people, at least in the United States, died as a result of it. How many insurrectionists on January 6th are now in jail, suffering for the lies that Trump told them? Weren't they duped? Weren't they victims of a lie that served Trump's purpose and not theirs? Yes which means that there is something that we can do about this problem. During an epidemic, we need to heal the sick, but we should also try to keep people from getting sick in the first place. So if we're in an infodemic, yes, we should talk to people who believe false things, but we should also try to keep them from hearing false things. The disinformation pipeline goes like this, from the creation to the amplification to belief. So in fighting disinformation, it's very hard to get a creator to stop creating it because it's not in their best interest to stop. Think here of Trump and Putin. Um, it's also very hard to get somebody who believes disinformation to stop believing it. Uh, Mark Twain once said that it's easier to fool somebody than to convince them that they've been fooled. Um, it, it is possible, but difficult to convince somebody that they were duped, especially if they've heard the falsehood from somebody that they trust, especially if it's something that they sort of wanted to believe in the first place. So I submit that the bulk of our effort should be spent right in the middle on the amplification problem. The creators, the believers, uh, those are a, a heavier lift. Let's focus on the amplification of disinformation because without amplification, disinformation wouldn't succeed. 
it's amplified this information is amplified on cable tv on social media what can we do about this well we can't wait for government regulation i wish that the government were better at what it's doing i mean we could encourage them we could threaten not to vote for them if they did more but do you really think that congress is going to get its act together before the next election to fight disinformation um biden's disinformation governance board lasted a few weeks because it succumbed to a disinformation campaign right now uh jim jordan is running his weaponization of government committee uh saying that the fight against disinformation is actually censorship which is completely bogus i mean refusing to amplify somebody's lie is not censorship you if you were a radical free speech uh, advocate and you thought that the ku klux klan had the right to free speech so they should get a permit a parade permit that's one thing does that mean that you have to go to the parade and hand out their flyers no you don't and the social media companies do not have to amplify disinformation well we can't wait so we can't wait for them to do anything about it either though because the social media companies what's in their best interest uh engagement conflict money uh eyeballs and they make a lot of money uh, on disinformation. And they will talk about all the things that they're doing, but what, it, what are they not doing? Um, and, and certainly they're not fighting back to the scale of the problem. They could. Uh, when is the last time you saw porn or terrorism or you know beheadings and all this terrible stuff on Facebook? And the answer is never. You never see that because they have a human team that scrubs for it. But you see disinformation all the time because they do not put the resources into scrubbing for that. And they they could. They did a little bit during the pandemic. They did just before the 2020 election, but then stopped. And the next thing that happened was January 6th. I'm not saying there was cause and effect. I'm just saying it might have contributed. They, they might have uh, uh, not changed the dials back on their algorithm. All right. You already know that one of the main goals of disinformation is to get you to believe a falsehood. A secondary goal of disinformation is to polarize you. And a third goal is to make you feel helpless, to make you feel like there's nothing you can do. It's not even worth talking to anybody or trying to influence Congress or trying to influence your uh, uh, cable TV provider or your internet company. But I'm here to tell you, you are not powerless. I wrote on disinformation as a citizen's guide for a grassroots revolution against disinformation. We need to have everybody involved in this, and we barely got enough time. In On Disinformation, I want you to recognize the threat that we actually face so that we can call out disinformation when we see it. We can encourage the media to do a better job of reporting on it. We can name names and stop treating this like it is a hurricane or some other kind of natural disaster. We can also pressure our elected officials, at least the ones who are listening, to speak out, to call it disinformation when it's disinformation. I wrote on disinformation as a small, compact citizen's guide to what uh, about what you can do to fight disinformation. And I outlined at the end of the book 10 steps you can take. Let me tell you right now the most important one. You cannot win an information war without first realizing that you're in one. What I'd like to do now is read you a few pages from the beginning of On Disinformation, and then I'd like to open it up for questions and hear what people have to say. Um, the first chapter of the book is called Truth Killers, and here's how it starts. The storming of the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021 was an American tragedy. It was also completely predictable. The patriots in face paint who carried sharpened flagpoles, bats, and zip ties into the Senate chamber were the inevitable result of 70 years of lies about tobacco, evolution, global warming, and vaccines. After the truth killers provided a blueprint for how to deny scientific facts that clashed with their financial or ideological interests, it was a small step for unscrupulous politicians to figure out how to use this strategy to lie about anything they wanted, such as the baseless claim that the 2020 presidential election was stolen and that the January 6th insurrectionists were actually peaceful protesters or Antifa in disguise. 
Welcome to the world of reality denial, where truth is subordinate to ideology, feelings have more weight than evidence, and democracy hangs in the balance. Throughout history, autocratic leaders and their wannabes have understood that the quickest way to control a population is to control their information source. But in a society that still has a free press, disinformation is the new censorship. Remember that scene in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where Harrison Ford has finally found the Holy Grail, but can't tell which one it is because it's surrounded by a hundred fakes? That's the point of disinformation. If you can't hide or destroy the truth, surround it with bullshit. You can always kill it later. The post-truth playbook goes like this. Attack the truth tellers. Lie about anything and everything. Manufacture disinformation. Encourage distrust and polarization. Create confusion and cynicism. Then claim that the truth is available only from the leader himself. The goal is not merely to get people to believe any particular false claim, but to demoralize them with a tsunami of falsehoods that they, that they begin to give up the idea that truth can be known at all outside of political context. In her landmark work on totalitarianism in the 20th century, political philosopher and Holocaust historian Hannah Arendt said it best, quote, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, no longer exists, end quote. More recently, another Holocaust historian, Timothy Snyder, put it even more succinctly, post-truth, is pre-fascism. We've got less than a year to figure this out. Now that Kevin McCarthy and the Republican faithful have su uh, succeeded in retaking the House in the 2022 election, midterm elections, which means that the GOP was effectively rewarded for having embraced Trump's big lie in 2021, they're perfectly positioned to install Trump or whomever they like as president, no matter the vote count in 2024. After that, some wonder how close we'll be to Orwell's nightmare, two plus two equals five, in the basement of the Ministry of Love. That's everything but the last paragraph of chapter one. So it's a short book. That was almost a whole chapter. And I'll turn it over now to questions. Okay. Wow. That was a really powerful reading and a great introduction. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, attendees who are on the uh, webinar to uh, put their questions in. Oh, we have one that's popped up already. And um, so Clifford's saying, thanks, Lee, for this excellent talk. Um, and is asking, what do you think about the rapid decline of Twitter or X, as it's mm -hmm. now called, and I'm putting that in, I just call it Twix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. But then I get hungry. Uh, so what do you think about the rapid decline of Twitter, which had been a flawed but important resource for a democratic political organization until Musk took over the company and gave free reign to pernicious actors? What can we do? Should we simply abandon the platform? A great question. I mean, Twitter was not a great fighter against disinformation even before Musk took over. It is, of course, worse now. The night before Musk took over Twitter, um, I looked on Twitter for a, a telltale sign. Back in 2019, the Center for Countering Digital Hate found that 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was due to 12 people. The night before Elon Musk took over, eight of them were still there. So that is not a ringing endorsement of how hard they were fighting disinformation. I haven't since checked to find out how many of them are still there, if any of them are, are back now. But Musk uh, did make it worse. And it's at least in part because he doesn't understand or he pretends not to understand that fighting disinformation and censorship are two different things. I mean, the First Amendment protects us from censorship from the government. But the social media companies are actually protected by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, has two parts in it. They can't be sued for anything they miss, but they can't be sued for anything they take down either. I mean, they could fight disinformation a lot harder if they want to. 
but they don't want to. And I think that he, uh, Musk in particular, doesn't want to because he's got an agenda. I have not myself abandoned Twitter. Um, it's hard because what's the alternative, especially for an author who wants to get the publicity out? When there is a better alternative, I will probably abandon it. But here's the thing. Maybe you don't have to abandon it. Maybe you need to put pressure on him to make it better. How many people would it take to write not just to Twitter, but to their advertisers? I mean, go for the money and say, I am going to abandon Twitter, you know, in six months and stop buying your products if you do not uh, you know, put pressure on him to fight harder against disinformation. If a few thousand people did that, um, you know, if that started as a grassroots effort, not just to go after Elon Musk personally, but after the advertisers on Twitter, boy, they would get the message because they have their own interests. I talk about this a little bit more in the book. So, you know, I have a lot of friends who have abandoned Twitter. I haven't yet. It's 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 hard. It's hard to know what to do. Yeah, I have yet to abandon Twitter either uh, personally or, and the library hasn't abandoned it yet for that same reason. We have a following on there and we need to get our information out. Um, um, yeah, great answer. Uh, but, and so I kind of have a follow up that I just wondering now, like as you were speaking though, and I've read like maybe Musk's end game is to destroy Twitter as a source and he doesn't care if he loses <laughs> all his advertisers. He, he's just taking it as a billion, couple billion dollar hit and moving on. Wow. Um, maybe. I I don't know. I mean, I I don't know. Um, yeah. The, when, one thing that occurs to me in this is one reason, uh, I, one reason that I haven't abandoned Twitter is because I lean into difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And if Twitter is now worse than it was before, because there are more people that I disagree with, I want that engagement. I want to be able to have those conversations. I went to a flat earth convention in 2018 to talk to people that I disagreed with, to try to get them to change their mind. I did not succeed in getting them to change their mind, but I got them to listen to me by being respectful, by being calm and patient with them, by trying to build some trust. Now that works much better in person than it does virtually. And maybe that's one problem with Twitter because even before Musk, Twitter was kind of mean. I mean, you get a lot more cat pictures and birthday parties on Facebook. You get you get some nastiness on Twitter. But um, I don't know. I, I still have hope that maybe it will become better. Uh, may, maybe. Okay. Uh, so we have a couple of questions that came in um, prior to this, um, and one from I see uh, Albert, who is here on this call. He had uh, entered it in through the platform ahead of time, and Albert wrote that he tries to understand better why discussions between people who have different views on an issue have these days these days become more frequently stressful, unproductive, and even unfriendly. He's noticed too often that one person's ego engages and they become defensive. Then the other person egos joins in and a verbal fight ensues. His question is this, when a person's ego gets in the way of an honest conversation and they become defensive, what's your advice how the other person might avoid engaging your own ego and instead bring the conversation back to being helpful yet honest? You're in luck. I wrote a whole book on this. Ooh. This is called How to Talk to a Science Denier. And what I realized is that well, disinformation is polarizing, and so people, you know, choose their team about factual beliefs. But here's the thing. It's not that they have a fact deficit. They have a trust deficit. They, they simply don't trust the people on the other side. And the way to overcome that is by, as I said, calm, respectful, face-to-face -face conversation. And, and here's the reason why. And this is sad, but I think it's true. People's beliefs are no longer just their beliefs, it's their identity. And when you attack their beliefs, you're attacking them as a person. You're insulting them. And that's uncomfortable. And so, you know, it, that's why these kind of conversations can feel adversarial. And so 
when I speak with, and my most experience in doing this is speaking with science deniers, with flat earthers, with climate deniers, with anti-vaxxers, I approach those conversations with curiosity. I'll ask them, why do you believe that? I, I won't give them an opportunity to just, you know, spout all the facts that they think I've missed, though sometimes if you just let them get that out of their system, then they'll listen. But, you know, I'll try to talk about the the reason why they believe it. You know, well, why do you trust that person rather than this person? Well, if you're such a skeptic and you think everybody's lying to you, why do you think this person isn't lying? Or the best question I've ever found that I stole from the philosopher Karl Popper, what evidence would convince you that you were wrong? I mean, that's not a disrespectful question, but it's a very powerful question because then the person has to think, oh my goodness, if I say nothing, then it's not an empirical belief, is it? Then it shows that I just believe it as a matter of faith and nothing could change my mind. But but now I've got to say what would change my mind. And usually the answer is nothing. So I, I put a smile on my face. I try to be non-threatening and I have these conversations um, in which sometimes I'll even ask permission. I'll say, well, you know, I think you're wrong. And I know that you think I'm wrong. But I'd really like to have a discussion with you because I'm curious why you think this. And I don't want to attack you. I hope you don't want to attack me. But I I really think there's a problem with your reasoning. Can we talk about that? You know, just ask permission. Can we talk about that? And they'll say, yeah, go ahead. Well, then, you know, I'm a philosopher. I'm, I'm on home turf. Then. I'm ready to question their logic. And the fun part, the fun part is that usually they're not prepared for that. They've got, you know, sheets and sheets of paper about studies I haven't read, which, you know, allegedly, you know, show that the CDC is a corrupt organization or whatever it is they're trying to convince me of. They are not prepared to talk about their logic. Excellent. Thank you. That's a great answer. Uh, so we've got a couple other, we've got three more questions coming in here. Let's see. We're going to go with Steve Hiltner's question here. He's wondering um, if an approach like the fairness doctrine that was repealed in the Reagan era and unleashed Limbaugh and others would still be relevant in our age for making disinformation more difficult. Yeah, I wrote about the fairness doctrine in this book. And the fairness doctrine is such an attractive idea, right? Because you can look back and say, this whole thing started when they repealed the fairness doctrine. The fairness doctrine used to be this idea that any news outlet had to give equal time to the other side. And the advantage of that is that it kept them from having too many fringe people on. Because when you had somebody on, you had to find somebody on the other side. Maybe, you know, if you were partisan, you didn't want to do that. You didn't want to give equal time to the other side. Well, they got rid of that. And next thing we got Rush Limbaugh, and then we got Fox News, and, you know, everything exploded from there. And so some people have said, well, why don't we bring back the fairness doctrine? Well, a couple of things. I mean, the Fairness Doctrine was about broadcast TV, and today we have cable TV, as, which is paid. So it's not even clear that how, I mean, Congress would have to think about it. You can't simply repeal the law that repealed the Fairness Doctrine, and you're off to the races. And it had, you'd have to do a new version of the Fairness Doctrine. But the, I mean, I like the idea behind, you know, thinking around that, because it really is it's a myth to think that, you know, we just need a thousand voices and the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, I mean, even President Obama once said, you know, we need to get more, we need to get more voices into the debate. No, not if some of them are liars, you don't. Uh, I mean, I once said that the halfway point between the truth and a lie is still a lie. I mean, you don't, you don't just let everybody speak as loudly as they can and hope the truth rises to the top. So, you know, balance across media is a myth. People don't watch all the channels. They watch one channel. And so if there's not balance in that channel, we're in big trouble. So it is very attractive to think that we might bring back the fairness doctrine, but it would have to be a new version of it. It would have to, and we'd have to think about the unintended consequences because yes, Fox News would have to have, you know, some other voices on. Well, so would everybody else. What would that mean? Would that mean that, you know, some, and I mean, what what is that, what are the other voices? 
one final thought on this. The fairness doctrine had to do with opinion content, not factual content. So you could still make the argument, well, that doesn't mean that when we you know, launch a NASA rocket, we have to have a flat earther on the split screen. That's not what the fairness doctrine would mean. I mean, that's false equivalence. Let's not do that. It's factual matter, not a matter of opinion. But there are an awful lot of things where you know we're arguing these days about who gets to decide what's fact and what's opinion. Who's the arbiter of that? How do we decide that we need equal time because what that person said was an opinion, not a fact? It's uh, it's fraud. I hope that they can think about this. I think we really need to do something. Uh, I'm I'm not sure that's the silver bullet, but it's an interesting idea, and I've written about it a little bit. Great. I was not aware of that whole um, doctrine, so that's interesting. Yeah. In the um, late 1980s is when this happened. Hmm. Um, so from Richard Corbett, then it kind of ties into that, you know, to what extent do you think defamation lawsuits could counter or can counter disinformation? Um, that's a thicket, isn't it? Because, I mean, look, uh, uh, here's the interesting thing. If a newspaper says something that's libelous, they can be sued. If they say something that's incorrect factually, they're expected to correct it and if they don't and it you know harms someone else again they can be sued tv programming um you know broadcast tv they have you know they're under threat of lawsuit as well you know who isn't under threat of lawsuit the internet companies section 230 of the communications decency act has two parts the first part and they this is the legislation that created the internet think about what the internet companies do. They post someone else's content. So what happens if they post content that, uh, you know, causes a death or, you know, is incendiary or libelous or slanderous or, you know, all those other things. Section 230 protects them from lawsuits. They say, we're just a platform. So if somebody else posts libelous content and we don't take it down, don't sue us. And there, you can't, you cannot sue an internet company for posting libelous content. But there's a second part to section 230 and everybody forgets about this part. The second part is that internet companies are free to take down anything they want for any reason that they want and not get sued for that either. Mm. So think about that the next time people are crying about freedom of speech and censorship. The internet companies are completely free under the law to take down whatever they like. They're, they're not required to hand out those leaflets at the Ku Klux Klan rally, right? They're just not. So uh, why don't they do more of, more of that? Changing the libel laws, that puts a little bit of a chill up my spine when I hear it because it reminds me of the threats that Trump made so many times. When he talks about changing the libel laws, I think it's because he wants to weaponize those laws to go after people, not because they're spreading disinformation, but because they're telling a truth that he doesn't like. Um, yeah, George Orwell said that uh, journalism is saying what somebody doesn't, printing what somebody doesn't want you to print, everything else is public relations, you know? so. Think about the things that make people uncomfortable when they see them in print. Would they like to be able to sue over it? Yeah, why? Well, not only because they've been slandered, but because sometimes that'll shut them down. That'll get the, that, that will uh, uh, hamstring uh, truth tellers from telling the truth. So I, I don't think the problem is so much that there are too many truth tellers. I think the problem is that there, we have not found a way to get to, unpollute the information environment by fighting even with the tools that we have in our hands. Mm. Wow. Um, and so Lori put in the chat, and I'm not even sure what this is about, I wanted to know, would deep canvassing, deep canvassing be a viable tactic to use? Yes. What What is deep canvassing? Could so you deep, deep canvassing is when you talk to people um, you know, uh, not just knock on the door, hand them a flyer, vote for my candidate. But when you really talk to someone, 
uh, if they'll allow you. I mean, to 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 have those deep conversations over matters of disagreement, it's uncomfortable. I'll give you the best reference that I know for this. I have uh, friends. Uh, they became friends. Uh, uh, Aaron, Dave and Aaron Neinhauser, their husband and wife team up in rural Pennsylvania, former labor organizers. They helped me set up a dinner with coal miners to talk about climate change. That's how I met them. And they run an organization called Hear Yourself Think. They are liberal Democrats. And they go to Trump rallies and have civil conversations that they film to show you how it's possible to do this. So I think that that's a type of deep canvassing and they're giving lessons about it. They offer seminars on how to do this. They are the bravest people, right? Because they're out there actually doing this. I mean, I went to a flat earth convention. They're going to a Trump rally where they sometimes get yelled at and threatened. But the interesting thing is if you watch these videos and sometimes they're uncomfortable, they get yelled at and threatened. And then when they don't react back with anger, sometimes the wind goes out of the other person's sails and they'll end up at the end of the conversation saying, you know, I really had a great conversation with you. That was really shocking and surprising to me. Maybe you've got a point. Face-to-face, -face, calm, patient conversation. That is very important. It is not the whole solution to this problem. You can debunk, you can try to rescue the victims. Ultimately, we've got to stop creating more victims. And to do that, I think you have to stop amplification. But deep canvassing, absolutely. Hearyourselfthink.org. It's a gold mine. Um, somebody wants to know the names of this couple again. Uh, Dave and Aaron Neinhauser, uh, just like the number nine, H-O-U-S-E-R. Here, I put it in the chat. Dave and Aaron Neinhauser. Neinhauser, yep. Okay. I get ab and I'm plugging them because they're awesome, not because I get any anything from it. They're just they're they're good people doing good work. So we can go and, and Google them. Yes. Um so somebody wanted to know, you know, why do we even need Twitter then? Well, I wow. Um I that's such a great question. Because if it's so, I mean, I, I, you know, that, that I like that philosophical technique. There's a, um, there's a philosophical technique, make your opponent's argument stronger to try to reduce it to absurdity. And maybe the claim there is, well, look, if Twitter's so awful, then why do we even need it? Maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. I'm, I'm going to have to meditate on that one. I don't, I don't have a snappy answer to that. That's, that's quite interesting. I mean, Am I part of the problem because I've been on Twitter all day trying to promote my book? Am I just giving them more oxygen? I don't know. I'm going to think about that. I'd be interested as a follow-up, the person who asked that question, uh, do they have do they have an answer? Do they do they think that we should just all abandon it and hope it closes down? Hmm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Carrie says that journalists seem to use Twitter the most. I think there's a lot. There's a lot. On, yeah, there are there's journalists and um, a lot of authors and writers are on there. I mean, Here we are. Yeah, yeah. That's and, how we and, find and, each other. It's how we find each other. And I, I have to say that you can get into a little silo on Twitter where it can be quite pleasant. You know, um, I stay on there because I have a nice little librarian silo and and a little author silo where mm -hmm. I've made some really great connections. Um, so do I abandon the rest of it? Do I abandon that, which is yeah. valuable? It's it's hard, right? Because, I mean, you could ask a similar question about, look, every technology that has ever been invented has been exploited by disinformers. Radio, TV, newspaper, I mean, every AI, everything, every new technology has this. Does that mean that we should abandon the platform? Probably not. We should just figure out how to do better regulation. We should figure out how to control it better than than we do. But um, it's uh, it's it's not a it's not a bad question. Yeah. 
So just before we go back to the actual questions that are in the chat, we had one that came in prior to the webinar, which I did want to get to. And someone was referencing, and I went and looked it up, I guess there was a two days ago, um, a poll came out um, in which it said that Trump voters trust him more than their own family and religious or faith leaders. Um, and that they just basically, um, they don't believe the media, anybody else in their circle, they only believe what Trump says. And this person wants to know then, um, does this really make Trump into a cult leader? There's a, there's a terrific book by Steve Hassan, who is a former Mooney, called The Cult of Trump, in which he makes exactly that argument. Um, he says that the tactics that Trump uses are cult tactics. And uh, he ought to know because he he was a former Mooney and you know got out of it. His I was on a program with him one time. We we were a co-panelists, and he's a very interesting person to talk to because the solution to getting somebody out of a cult is what he calls a love bomb. You don't yell at them. You don't tell them they were stupid. You don't alienate them and cut them off. You show them love. You show them that they have something to come back to. You, you feed that sense of, well, that's not your only identity. You still have an identity with us as a family, with your friends. We miss you. We love you. You've, oh, you can always come home. That's, that's very important. So 57%, I remember being the number who said that they trusted Trump more than faith leaders, more than the media, more, I forget what it was. It was three other, you know, job dropping family, more, family more and their, friends. Yeah. yeah. Like they, um, look, trust can be built. Trust can be broken. Um, and people do change their mind. Uh, there was a study in 2010 by a political scientist named David Redlosk in which he ran a phony a political campaign. The people who were in it knew that it was phony. There were three candidates. It was a primary campaign. And, you know, he gave them each a phony biography and phony pictures, you know, the whole thing. And then he assigned people to, you know, their different candidates and who were they going to support. And then he had a news feed and he, you know, you know this candidate did this day, this candidate did that day. Now, how likely are you to vote for them? Do you want to change candidates? You know, and he measured it over time. And he started, of course, to put in negative information. Interesting. What he found is that the first time he put in negative information, support went up for that candidate. Does that sound familiar? I mean, this was 2010. You say something bad and the support goes up. By the end of the study, though, what he found is <laughs> that when there's too much bad information, they will abandon their candidate. And it happens suddenly, all of them, because there's a community aspect to the belief. I think that might be what happens with Trump. He is very on top of the world now and everybody's wondering, you know, or they predicted his demise before. I I wonder, I'm not making a prediction. I'm wondering in public whether, you know, at what point this happens, because that's what Red Lost study was about. It's an empirically very interesting study called the tipping point. You know, the, the, uh, mm -hmm. do motivated reasoners ever get it? You know, uh, uh, the, the, was there an effective tipping point, uh, affective with, a, with an A? And um, there was. Now, this was an experiment. Does it apply to the real world? We'll, we'll see. Because there's more bad news coming for Trump, and we'll see how much of that peels away. Look, there's a Republican debate on tonight. They've already peeled, used to be not that many months ago, no Republican would come out against him. Now, Chris Christie, Mike Pence, a few others. I mean, it may happen. Yeah. Um, this information will still be a threat, however. Even yes. if Trump leaves the scene, the damage has been done. And by the way, that thing that I read earlier, people have to understand, the piece of our Constitution that allows the House to install who they want is still there. Even though we, re we uh, reformed the Electoral Reform Act, that piece is still there. The, the coup that Trump tried on January 6th is still possible. It's a little bit harder now because the vice president's role has been more clearly defined, et cetera, et cetera. But that, 
I forget which paragraph it's in, which part and paragraph, but that crucial part where, you know, if they can't, uh, if they don't have enough uh, uh, clarity on the electors, it gets thrown to the House and each state gets one vote. That's still in the Constitution. That could still happen. Hmm. Um, a comment in the chat, which um, I had never heard of this organization before. I'm sure you have uh, the West, West Belt Rising. Don't know it. Uh, they are giving uh, seminars on how to reach others based on eliciting shared values in conversation. And so they have one called Reaching Beyond Our Own Choir. It's being taught this month in four Zoom seminars and hopefully they'll be giving it again. I put the link to Rust Belt Rising there in the chat in case anybody was interested. I've also put into the I chat uh, links for how to talk to a science denier, which is available at PPL. I also checked it's available if you wanna go down to Labyrinth Books downtown, they have some in stock. Um, and of course, since your book just came out yesterday, it's still getting cataloged, as I said, but you can, mm -hmm. um, I know I also talked to Labyrinth Books today. They have some on order that they- Oh, great. That's, yeah, that, have, that's wonderful. They haven't got them in yet, um, but they, but uh, Labyrinth Books actually has almost a whole back catalog of your titles. Oh, so anybody, isn't that nice? So if anybody yeah. wants, Labyrinth Books is our local bookstore that we all like to support. So go down to Labyrinth if you need to get a okay. fix here. Thank you for telling um, me that. So uh, we have a question also then from Steve who put that in about the Rust Belt Rising, wanting to know what we can do to stop the silos of disinformation in the media that are so well-funded and have such an extensive reach. Um, Expose them. Uh, how many people know what the, the premise of the question there, uh, how many people understand that disinformation is funded, that there are people, nameable organizations behind it, that there's money behind it? Uh, the most effective thing you can do is to expose it. There are, um, I'm thinking of that uh, book by Jane Mayer, Dark Money. She had another, she had an art, a later article in the New York Times where she did some of this. I mean, she is a master at doing this, people really have no idea the amount of money and influence that just a few people have over the news diet uh, that we that we get. Um, it, it's it, it's sort of amazing. Um, I myself, I like the BBC. I like the BBC because you know whenever I can find it because they actually do a very good job of reporting on American politics. Hmm. They're, my complaint against some of the mainstream media networks, other than Fox, I mean, Fox's problems are, are obvious that we all saw in the Dominion lawsuit, but even some of the other ones, sometimes they engage in confirmation bias. They'll leave out part of the narrative that they don't think is gonna track with their audience. Uh, BBC does, I, I think, a very good job. There are some people, in the mainstream media who do a superb job. Uh, I highly recommend uh, four o'clock on MSNBC, uh, Nicole Wallace. She does a terrific job of always getting it right. What's the difference between mis and disinformation? I've never heard her say misinformation when she meant disinformation. But a lot of the other ones get it wrong. Yeah. And our, our last question in the uh, coming in is, you know, have we now gone beyond having an accepted source of truth? Do we now have to distrust all sources? No, that is exactly the point of disinformation. They want you to remember, they want you to give up. Remember the quote from Hannah Arendt? They want you to give up. They want you to say, oh my God, truth is so difficult to know. I, I guess we can't even have it. It's just, I can't fact check everything. I'm just going to be skeptical of everybody. That kind of false equivalence. Uh, means what? That the perpetrators get away with it. If there's no truth, there's no blame. And if there's no blame, there's no accountability. So we we should not give up on truth. We need to fight lies with truth. We need to tell the truth more often. We need more truth tellers. I talked to some counterintelligence officials and military officials about how they fight disinformation wars because they fight them all the time against foreign governments they can't fight them domestically however because the constitution forbids it they they fight it by countering it with truth 
and and by trying to match the messengers of the truth to the message of the uh, to the uh, community that they're trying to get through to um we need to do that on the domestic front have you ever found yourself saying well you know i told them the truth they didn't listen so i walked away no how many times has trump said it's a hoax it's a witch hunt a million times why because it works so i mean saying the truth over and over is tedious but you know when I didn't see the report this morning, but I heard about it from a neighbor when Rudy Giuliani comes on the news and says, you know, oh, this is outrageous. It's weaponization, you know, how he's being persecuted. Someone could say, no, you committed a crime. Every time he says that, you could say, no, you committed a crime. If you said that and made that the mantra every single time, maybe it would begin to sink in. You can't just say it once and walk away. Right. Well, we're coming up to the top of our hour and our questions seem to have been all answered, which is great timing. Okay. Um, <laughs> so do you have any closing words for us, Lee, um, as we as we go forth and get ready to fight yeah. the disinformation machine? Yes. If you read my book and you enjoy it, don't put it on a shelf. Pass it to a friend. I made it tiny. It is, it is the, in fact, the exact same size and dimension of On Tyranny. So you can you can fit this in your back pocket. Leave a spare copy on the bus for somebody else. Hand it to a friend. Hand it to somebody that you disagree with. I intend this book to be, you know, dog-eared and passed around and marked up. I want it to be used. It is a training manual, is how I, I think of it. So so please do me the honor. I, I don't want just all your friends to uh, look. It would be nice if your friends bought the book. It'd be nice if you bought the book. But I really don't care if you've got one copy that goes around to a hundred people. That's fine. I just I want it to be circulated. That's why uh, library talks are always so wonderful because you are the tip of the spear in getting the word yes. out. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Well, and the Princeton Public Library, we are in the midst of planning um, a whole series coming up. Um, on democracy. We're going to be doing a democracy forum um, in December with um, invited guests to talk about, you know, what can we do to save our democracy, focusing on that and in the run up mm -hmm. to the 2024 election. Um, we have people here in the chat saying, you know, great program and thank you. Oh, and yes, you I agree. Much. You know, and, and Lee, I think it's really important to note too as well, like the price point of this book is $15. So yes, read it, pass it along, share it. Um, it's a comfortable, it's a comfortable size, it's digestible, it's a good price point for that, which I thank you for doing that and not putting, you know, um, and hopefully it will get out there. We, we're working right now, our own library staff on creating a guide to um, misinformation and disinformation and having a, a you know, classes on that, because I, I think that point was very um, important that misinformation is not deliberate, whereas disinformation is. And I think a lot of people yes, do not understand yes. that. That is crucial. And as library and information professionals, we do understand that. And, you know, we we see our role to make sure that we have an informed electorate. And uh, we're going to be working on that. Um, yeah, we have a lot of people saying here, um, just saying that thank you for this excellent work and joining us and that this was such an informative Great. program. I appreciate so you, it. I think your, your job here is done tonight and congratulations okay. on the launch of this book and a successful launch. And um, anytime you wanna come back and speak to us at Princeton in person or on Zoom, uh, our platform is yours. If you find yourself down visiting Princeton University, let thank us you. know. We're just literally two blocks from the gates of the university down there. Oh, that, that's right. that's wonderful. I'll go to Labyrinth Books too. Find me at my website, leemacintyrebooks.com. Uh, yeah. You can find my email address there. Uh, I guess you can also find me on Twitter. Wouldn't that be ironic after the conversation we just had? <laughs> but right now I need to go watch the Republican debate and figure yes, out we all, do. all the disinformation that's going to come my way. This is my uh, sporting event to watch that debate. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Jane. you. And I know we're going to close on the words from attendee that said, this is an excellent program. This is from Steve Hiltner. It says truth is a unifying force in the world, which is why it is so frequently attacked by those who need an enemy. So let's move that. Truth is our unifying force. Let's go forth and watch this debate or not watch the debate and get the play by play. I'm going over okay. to Twitter right now to catch the commentary. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks everybody.